Hey guys, it is Esti and Justin from Not For Long Media. If you like the video you're about to watch, be sure to like the video itself and subscribe to our channel. We really appreciate it. Enjoy the video and also don't forget to follow us on our socials at Not For Long Media on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. All right, so we got the great Brian O'Grady on today, Archbishop Wood alumni. We went to high school together, uh, played basketball together, couldn't coerce Brian to play football. He's a smart man and decided to stick with baseball and focus his off seasons on that, which he's smart. And uh, went to Rutgers, had a great career there, and uh, bounced around the MLB and uh, played for the Reds, the Rays, for the Padres of recently, and then has a new team. We'll get into that in a minute. So, Brian, how you doing today, bro? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me, Colin. It's fun to be uh, fun to be back. We did this what a little over a year ago. Yes, we did this over a year ago. Yeah. Right, right uh, during COVID. Yeah, I think when everything shut down. I think. Yep, and it was a different version of the podcast. And I, I want to bring those podcast to this forum like i'm gonna maybe we put them up on we've talked about this before justin maybe we put them all up on youtube because they're like that was a i talked to a bunch of people during that and that's not this version of not for long media that's an old one i restarted it this off season uh so i brought in the big hitters like justin Ayers and our team and not for long i needed some help so where are you at now what what's the latest and greatest I, yeah, I'm in uh, I'm in my house now. I live in Gulf Breeze, Florida, where my my wife's from uh, down here. Um, so I know we, we talked before. I think you were in Destin the last time we talked, right? Yep. So that's uh, Destin's about 45 minutes from me. So I'm a little more west. But yeah, we bought a house here. So this is this is home base now for me in the off season and everything. Um, Love it. So yeah, just uh, you know, working out, getting ready, uh, getting ready for the season, man. Just enjoying my time at home <laughs> right now. Isn't Florida the best? Dude, I I miss I miss my family. Obviously, I'm trying to get them all down here uh, slowly but surely. Um, but I, I do. I love it down here. Um, I miss the cold a little bit. Not the freezing cold, but I do miss, uh, like today, it's 70 degrees, which is, like, nice. But sometimes I wish it was just, like, 45 for, like, a week, you know? You just want to throw a hoodie on. That's yeah. – and that's Charlotte. I'm lucky to live here because – the very mild seasons we've had some cold we've had some like 20s and 30s and 40s and windy but today's nice it's like 50 and breezy yeah. it's nice yeah i love florida I miss it down there i will definitely end up there someday but uh, uh, uh your family's growing congrats to you and your wife thank you man yeah we got uh my daughter's due in the beginning of may right now so that'll be uh <clears throat> be a lot of fun my wife's starting to really show that she's pregnant. So she's little, so it's funny. Um, but yeah, we're super, super excited about that. And, uh, I don't know, man, we'll, uh, we'll see. It's going to be, it's definitely going to be an adventure. That's awesome, man. Congratulations to you guys. That's great. And, uh, all right. So before Justin and I, now Justin wouldn't butcher this, but I would butcher this, let our <laughs> listeners know where you just signed and, and kind of what's the latest and greatest in the baseball world for you. So I just signed with, uh, the Japanese professional leagues called the MPB Nippon professional baseball. Um, I signed with a team there called the Cebu lions. So that is where I'll be heading for this season, man. So I'm pretty, That's I'm awesome. pretty excited about it. How did that come to fruition? You know, are you at a crossroads in your MLB <clears throat> career and you need to figure out what the next step is or because of the lockout or, or why did you decide to go there? Yeah, I, there's definitely, a couple things that that went into it um if you go all the way back you know i was drafted after my senior year so i was kind of a little bit of a late start uh in the minor leagues and then played well in the beginning struggled for a few years and that kind of put me behind the eight ball in terms of like baseball it's all about like prospects and like you know if you're not figuring it out by a certain age you kind of get written off a little bit but I ended up making that adjustment that, you know, they couldn't deny me anymore. Basically, I was playing too well for any of that to happen. So I, I ended up getting the big leagues. But right before that, I, I kind of knew that Korea or Japan would be an option. And I kind of knew that they were like scouting me at my games. Um, so back then I knew it would be an option, but then I made it to the major leagues. And obviously I, I bounced around um, since then. But 
last year before I signed with the Padres, um, I was about to go to Korea, a team in, in Korea. Um, but then the Padres, you know, beat the offer basically and, and kept me here, which I was very happy about. But this year, um, Japan is considered the best league outside of the major leagues in baseball. So better than AAA, better than any of the minor leagues. Pay really well. It's guaranteed. And for me, um, I just haven't had that opportunity to be in the big leagues and just like play. You know, I've always been with uh, options. I've been able to go up and down between AAA and I've just been that guy. So I go to AAA and play really well, always go up and maybe pinch hit or, you know, pinch hitting really, really hard in the major leagues. It just, it is. So that's been the majority of my at bats up there. So, um, going back to AAA right now and playing really well again, wouldn't do anything for me. It just from the perspective of major league teams. So if I go over here and I, I play really well, um, that would give me an opportunity now to come back and, and get a comp and get a legit contract here where I would have bounced up and down. Um, and also, you know, Japan, you play really well over there. They'll throw a lot of money at you to keep you there too. So it's uh, definitely all those things. And then, yeah, the lockout, man, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, as athletes, we have a short amount of time to make this money and, and do what we do. So um you know, I, I think I think everything will be fine with that. But the off chance that stuff was messed up, I, you know, I couldn't be sitting on my couch come come April or whatever. Just, you know, like you said, grown family house things. You can't, can't have that happen. Yeah, the uh, the and we'll get into the lockout here and I'll in a little bit. But I, I want to touch on a few things you brought up because I've had a very similar path in a way with trying to yeah. crack crack into the league and actually get real reps. I've been blessed the last two years to be able to get real reps that mean something that you can get, you know, a batting average with and, and can you can. OK, if you make a mistake on, you know, say uh, 10 plays, uh, you know, that's kind of a small sample size. But you play 30 plays and you make four mistakes instead of at 40 percent, you're screwing up, you know, whatever that percentage is out of 30. I yeah. went to wood, so I can't really do that math too quickly. <laughs> uh you know, that's the difference, right? And you, same thing you with you, like if you're in the lineup and you're hitting seventh every day or sixth every day, then you could say here, I'm here to stay. I have comfortability. You can build your, your off season around that. You can build your daily attack out of that. I mean, that's how I vision things. I don't need to go splash in a pan and, and, and have a, for you, I don't need to hit a grand slam. I can just hit singles every day and be consistent. And, and that's in my world, I had to go back down to the AAF. I had to go back down to the XFL. I didn't have a choice. I probably could have been a camp body. We call them. You're in training camp. You're the sixth tight end. You're grinding. You're playing a ton of preseason reps and they're just grinding in the ground. And then, and there's, I love that. I've done that through my whole career, but it's hard to make crack that 53 and then crack to 46 active and then actually play out of those 46 guys. So I hear you, man. I feel it. And, and good for you that, Right. It takes a maturity. It takes a confidence level. It takes a family buy in. Right. My family's all in on this. My wife, your wife's all in on this. Right. So, yeah, man, I don't know what it's like maybe to go to Japan, but I hear you. I went to Birmingham and I went to Tampa, which are two great places, but uh, a little bit different. So, you know, how does it go down? Are they are they reaching out to your agent? You know, through this whole process, even when you're with the Padres or, hey, the season ends and let's bring Brian over now. Yeah. So. In 2019, before I made my debut with the Reds, I switched agencies to where I'm at now because my buddy, um, my buddy, this was his agency, and they had plenty of experience sending guys to uh, Asia to play. And I was start, I was just kind of frustrated. You know, I was playing really well. It was getting later in the season. I still hadn't been called up, so I was like, you know what, this really might be an option or a route for me. So I switched then ended up getting up there. Um, but I, I knew they were at my games a lot um, since, since then, but then, uh, yeah. So last year they reached out to my, to my agent, um, Korea. <clears throat> and uh, obviously uh, yeah, I ended up with the Padres, but then after this year, um, more of the same and Japan's really, you know, I really wanted to go to Japan um, if I was going to go somewhere. Um, so yeah, right after, uh, you know, we kind of had an idea 
with the way things shook out with the Padres towards the end of the season that they were probably going to, we say DFA, uh, take me off the 40 man roster and, and I would end up being a free agent again. Um, so, you know, we knew we had that interest there. And then when it, when that happened, it was, you know, it was quick. It was talking to them right away. Um, so that's basically how, how it happened this year. And it was, it, it was fast, man. I mean, they kind of, you know, they, they have over there, they have the list of guys they think, you know, we might be able to get these guys or whatever. So I was basically for this team was their priority. They, you know, I was who they wanted to come over there, but they have backups, you know, they got to have, cause some guys don't want to go or whatever it is. Um, so, you know, basically when it got down to it and we agreed on things, they're like, we need to know in a week or whatever. So it's basically <laughs> making that decision then, but it's just all the pros just, you know, there's, there's too many good things that, that I, you know, just couldn't turn down. Um, so it took a couple of years, but you know, we ended, <laughs> we're ending up over there at, at least now. No doubt. The process is, is, a, is a real thing, man, to make it to where you want to go and right. The end goal is to be a stay at home guy for, for somebody yeah. for, for, for years and, and experience that there's, there's nothing like it last year. And this year has been awesome for me and, and just humble to be a part of it. So Two more quick things for me, and then I'm going to send it over to Justin, and he's got plenty of questions for you. Uh, before you left, was there an M MLB team saying, you know, don't sign this, we want to bring you in? This year? Yes, this year. Before, no, I shouldn't say before you signed to your new team. Yeah. Okay. So, yes and no. Um, what, what I was looking for over here to match this deal was, like, very, very slim – chance that it was going to happen you know like I was basically looking for a guaranteed major league deal which especially with the lockout coming or you know things like that like it just probably wasn't going to happen you know if I'm being totally honest about where I'm at um so we tried and there were teams who were like you know like, we got to talk about it or whatever but it was it's also it was so early for them too um that it just just didn't happen so this year you know, last year was a little bit later with Korea and, and I had that deal as leverage and the Padres, like I said, you know, matched it and everything. But this year um, it just didn't work out that way. And, you know, it, it's just a it's a strange year for for baseball in general, but especially, you know, the MLB. What do you mean? You didn't want to sign with the Phillies, Brian? You don't want to come home? Yeah, <laughs> Insert man. every single no. Archbishop Wood graduate and everybody from Philly there. I, you know, that's obviously growing up there. That would be awesome one day. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Who knows? But who knows? Yeah. You know, that would obviously that's a soft spot that I think we we all have wherever we, you know, grow yeah. up. Play for it was that. funny. So I was listening to uh Fran Walsh has a podcast and and I was lucky enough to be on it. I'm sure you'll be asked along your way to be on it. And and uh Mike McGlitchy was on it yesterday and Mike was talking about the reason why I didn't want to play for the Eagles coming out, like I was deathly afraid of it, is because on WIP the next day. Everyone's going to be saying how bad I am. And my parents have to walk around and work and just how bad I am. And he said, now that I'm older, I would be able to handle a little bit differently. My, maybe maybe a second contract could be in Philly. I thought that was interesting. I could too now, but I don't know if yeah. I could right away. I think I could, but looking back, I, don't, I struggled with the Giants and that was up the road. Yeah. Let, let, Cause everyone's there. Your time's being taken differently. You know, instead of going in and getting that ice tub and getting ready to eat a meal and relaxing after practice, you got, you know, which I loved 10 people there after practice for an hour, then I'm running to get a shower. My recovery is not the same. So it takes up a little bit more of your time. There's definitely pros and cons to it, but yeah. I think you're right. Maybe when you get a little bit older, it's not as bad, but definitely some extra pressure that comes with it too. All right. So last thing for me, and we'll send it over to Justin. So I saw on Twitter, did somebody tweet one day, like that you were signing with the, with the team you just signed with? And you're like, I don't know what you're talking about, bro. And then it happened like a week later. Is that real? Did yeah. I see that? So in Japan, the fans are like, it's crazy. They love it. It's that's like their big thing aside from sumo wrestling, literally. And it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I guess how it happened was I follow, I was following this team or and like the the leagues you know twitter or whatever and i was following like two other teams i i don't even remember but i guess um people noticed 
and they like put two and two together somehow that it was like this specific team. And then all of a sudden it came out in like Yahoo Sports Japan and they're, they're like ESPN is called Nikon Sports over there. So they like wrote a story about it. And this uh, Twitter, it's like MLB, I forget what it's called, but it, it's date. Yeah, it's got like, I don't know, a couple thousand followers, whatever. But they, tw- they tweeted that the Padres traded me to Japan. Not that I signed there, like, you know, Padres trade Brian O'Grady to save the lines. And I was like, and I'm getting blown up by everybody. Like, <laughs> you know, what's this? And I just said, yeah, like, that's not true. Is Back it even possible? Can no, they not, it's, no, you can't get traded from. Uh, there was a big joke, dude. The Phillies did it. The video is still out there. I can't remember the picture that they did it to the Phillies did it. This was like when we were probably in high school or maybe even grade school, the guys from the Phillies played a, played a prank on like a young pitcher saying he got like, they got the manager to say and everything traded to Japan for somebody. And he like the media was in on it, like asking him questions, this whole big thing. You can find it on YouTube. So like, I'm sure the guy was like, biggest fear was going to play in Japan. He's probably like, <laughs> I don't want to go there. <laughs> so yeah, that was it. It was just, but yeah, in the back of my mind, I'm like, crap, like, you know, they, they're kind of right, but I didn't get tra- – I was a free agent. It wasn't like I got traded, but, yeah, it was uh, It was funny. But that's – yeah, <laughs> they, were, they were kind of spot on. They kind of knew, though. And uh was on our best day, right? So everyone was a little upset, I think, offensively. But it's all right. It's not a, it's not a rock the boat day. It just wasn't a good day. And, you know, we were supposed to all go over as a team and have a home run derby. I'm like, let's go, you know. I'm all jacked up for this. <laughs> go over there. There's like three guys. But – now, more people trickled in, but, you know, I thought because of my years of playing, you know, beer baseball, we call slosh ball uh, pretty much as a metal bat and a tennis ball. And I just absolutely would be crushing the ball. I, I learned that game in my time in Gainesville. Shout out to all the Gainesville folks I play with out in Florida with it. But I would just absolutely demolish the ball like out onto the roof like crazy. So I was taking that swing with a bat and a ball and I was just destroying my hands and my wrists and I was just hitting like just bloopers, like barely past first base. And I'm like, whoa, what is going on? So I, <laughs> Brian, I was like dialing into my youth, like elbow up. Like I was trying to mimic your swing a little bit. But the problem was I wasn't hitting with the Richie bat. Yeah. So that's why. Yep. That was horrible. Yeah. We had some guys like hitting ropes. Shaq Thompson, our linebacker, he was he played for the Red Sox organization for a couple of years. Oh, wow. I, didn't know. I didn't know. He's a monster. He's like a pro bowler linebacker. But like he got up there. And I didn't even know. And I just, you can hear the sound, right? You just know. And I was like, who's, who is that? Uh, he would definitely, you know, I don't know if he'd be in the majors, but he's an unreal athlete yeah. and would be great. And then JJ Jansen, our long snapper, who was like a baseball player through and through and his baseball buddies were just like, Hey, come play football with us. So he started snapping and here he is in the NFL 15 years later snapping. That's so awesome. we have, we have a decent little unit. Robbie Anderson can run a temple guy. Robbie was hitting. So Robbie could honestly, Robbie wouldn't be one of those football players that will get drafted now out of nowhere because he can run a four one forty. Yeah. And he'll track every ball down. He doesn't drop the ball. Yep. So I'm like, but it was fun. It was really cool, man. That backdrop there is incredible. Um, sure. Dude, yeah, swinging the bat is a different. It's it's different, man. It's no matter how athletic you are, it's just like a different skill. It really is. Yeah, I right. forget after I just started hitting last week, and I'm like, the first time, I'm like, dude, I don't even remember how to how to do this. Like, it takes co- takes a couple of minutes for me to like remember how to actually swing and <laughs> do everything. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, I need to play a little bit more beer base beer baseball, maybe. You know, that maybe would be the solution. So. Yeah. There you go in the off season. What do you got, Jay? After your you know rainstorm in Annapolis, there. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. this lockout, I'm just so fascinated by it because everybody that played in the big leagues this year knew it was coming. Like it didn't sneak up on anybody. Like the CBA expired. Everybody knew the date. Uh, I think that's why so many guys jumped out ahead and tried to get contracts before you know they went on a lockout. But like as somebody who was in a locker room all season. And, you, you know, were there any conversations t- taking place with the guys about like c- the issues that are going to be coming up in the CBA discussions or like what, what would kind of like the, the behind the scenes stuff with the guys, you know, knowing that, all right, we might have to go on a lockout here this, this winter. Yeah, there definitely was conversations uh, all year because obviously everybody on the 40 man is reflected. So we would have group chats of it, you know, in the locker room in the major leagues, be talking about it because, um, you know, we have some uh, – the guys I was with, 
uh, been around a while, are pretty, you know, influential players, um, Manny Machado, Eric Hosmer, you know, now Tatis. Um, so, and then our, our union guy there was, uh, Craig Stammen, who's been in the, I, I mean, he's, he got over 10 years this year. Um, and he's a really smart guy. So we, we talked a lot about things like that and it's, I don't think it was something that could be avoided. You know, the, the lockout could have been avoided. The lockout's the owner saying, hey, we're, you know, we're locking you guys out until we get this done. So that was on them. But I, I don't think I don't think either side thought that a deal would come before this date that they had, you know, December 1st that they had set. Um, there's just too much to iron out. Um, too much the owners don't want to give up that the players kind of want. Um, but they're good. They're going to get it done. I, I totally think that it's just, uh, it's going to take some time for sure. Um, but you know, guys, guys want to play. There's no doubt about that. You know, no one wants to not play. Nobody truly wants to go on a strike or anything like that and miss games. But, uh, and especially after the COVID year, man, you know, it's guys, guys want to make their money, uh, you know, as bad as that might sound, you know, they just, they want to make their money that they're, that they're owed when they lost a lot that last year. So um, it's definitely, it's, it's a lot, but they'll get it done at some point. I think. What is, uh, on the, oh, oh, what is on the top of the list? And I'll send it back to you. Sorry, Justin. What's on the top of the list for you, for the players, Bry? Man. If I had to just say what, like the, the games moved to, they have younger guys playing the best. All right. This is the best way to say it. The middle class of baseball, which is the vast majority of players is like non-existent anymore. They're not making any, any money. And there's the, the, the data on that, you know, that average contract for whatever that is, you know, has gone down millions and millions of dollars in the last eight years. So, <clears throat> You know, the guys who your superstars who are making all those millions and hundred millions of dollars like that is, you know, the top one percent or top maybe five percent in baseball. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's it's almost impossible to 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 get to that, you know. So the guys who are good players who have been around a little bit, vets, they're just maybe a little bit older, 32, 33 in, in baseball. You're not actually old, but um they stopped paying those guys a few years ago, basically. And they bring up young kids and give them a chance, basically sink or swim because they're cheaper. Um, they're on the league minimum. And that's basically what they've been doing. And you see the teams tanking and just throwing, you know, there's some pretty bad <laughs> MLB teams out there because that's what's worked. So I think the getting guys – the middle class and the vast majority of guys to actually make some money again. Um, and the competition are probably one, a one B there of the top, top of the list for players. That was, that was my next question, Colin. Yeah. Cause like so many of these issues you read about, like you go on ESPN or MLB network, they're talking about like luxury tax thresholds and, and all these kind of like high tier, like issues that are going on with the lockout that don't necessarily affect the day to day, like the, the, you know, the average players. But, like, I'd have to imagine that, like, the free agency and the service time aspects of this lockout, I'm, I'm sure that, like, those are obviously the ones you're most passionate about. Um, are, are guys just, like, are, do, is a massive change coming, do you feel like, with that when it comes to service time? Are, are we going to see Chris Bryant being held down in the minors so teams could have an extra year of control for them? Um, like, do you, do you foresee these kind of things coming to an head here? That's what's going to be, you know, really – obviously, I'm still following all of this because – you know, my goal eventually is to, to play there again, but um, I'm interested to see what, what they do. Uh, Cause the owners, I mean, from a team's perspective, I don't blame them for, you know, maneuvering around the rules like that. Like it makes total sense to keep a guy down for three weeks to have him for a whole extra year. Like that may, makes sense from a team perspective, but from the player and competition perspective, like obviously that's not, how you want it you want the best players on the field you know all the time so I don't know how they're going to work it out because the players don't have a ton to give back to the owners 
you know, the owners are doing really, really well. Revenues have gone way up. You know, they own the team for years and years. It stays in the family half the time, you know, players, the vast majority of players just have such a short lifespan there that, you know, we got to do something for them, but we can give them basically expanded playoffs is one thing that they want. And that would be a lot more money for the owners. I don't think, you know, from a player's perspective, the owners try to say that it's going to be more money for more players too. But in reality, it's really not going to, you know, it might be a little bit, but it's really not, you know, anything that the players would be dying for. Um, so I, I, I don't know how they're going to work it out, but there's too much money. It'll look too bad, you know, in today's climate with everything going on to not play. And there's just, I mean, you know, the MLB does well, but the NFL is still there basketball is still there you know you can't you'll be forgotten or people will be pissed off and you know not come back if if you miss games right a lot of this like you can kind of see both sides of it because you know a lot of these small market teams like the pirates and the orioles they kind of rely on guys on those rookie deals making 500k like the nationals have made out so well with juan soto making 500k uh and they're you know able to use that money elsewhere um, but yeah, it, it's just, it's so interesting. Is there anything else that you're following any other aspects of the lockout, um, you know, that, that really intrigue you as, uh, as you're keeping track here this off season? I really, the, the tanking is definitely something that I'm interested to see how they rectify that because it's just, I mean, it's really obvious, you know, when, when teams are doing that, but what, what started it all was, you know, the, the Royals, when they won the world series um, were all homegrown guys, high picks because they were so bad for many years. And then the Astros just did it, you know, not too long ago. And now you see how good they've been the past, however many years it is, but you know, you can't, I don't know if they're going to change it up for the draft order. You know, like I, I saw something, the, the, the team with the best record out of the non-playoff teams would get the first pick was something I saw um, as opposed to, you know, just the worst record. Um, just giving teams more incentive to, to win basically. So, because, you know, you see like the pirates, I'm trying to think of teams that were really bad. The pirates, the Orioles, you know, they're just not paying their payrolls are lower than individual players. Or Phillies. Oh no. Sorry. Did I just say that? My bad. I, went. <laughs> I think I saw something, you know, well, Max Scherzer is now making $41 million or something for this season. And that's more than the Pirates, the Orioles. It was like five teams spent last year on their whole roster. And that's, that's crazy. I mean, that's crazy. So the gap, you know, at the end of the day, the owners really want a salary cap like football has. And the, uh, the luxury tax is kind of operated as like a soft salary cap. But that's true. That when they're trying to say, you know, we'll make teams spend a hundred million dollars. Well, that's, the fear from the players and the union is that that's going to end up being, well, this is as much as you can spend, you know, which obviously players don't want, they want, you know, spend, <laughs> they want them to spend all the money. So there's luckily a lot more way smarter people than me working on, you know, these things as we, as we speak. And I, I get to sit back and see what happens. I love it. So, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's entertainment because, you know, you're the product you're putting out on the field. People are, you know, you're trying to get them to spend money to come out to the ballpark. And when you're losing 120 games, you know, I, I live in Maryland, so I'm an Orioles guy. So it's, it's kind of hard to be, you know, carrying the, carrying the flag and cheering them on when they're, you know, spending $10 on their team every year. Um, I, I'd love to shift gears uh, briefly and just kind of talk about your career because I was doing a lot of reading about like, you know, coming up through Rutgers and all the minor league stuff you had. Uh, position versatility is something that I've seen come up when I, when reading all about you, um, all three outfield spots, first base, I think maybe in a little third base mixed in there for you, um, all very different skill sets. Like how are you able to develop this position versatility and carry it with you throughout your career? It started back when I was young. Um, I always played infield, always played shortstop third base. Um, my freshman year at Wood, I was on varsity and, they stuck me in right field just to like have me playing. And uh, so that's, that was my first taste ever of the outfield moved back to third base my sophomore year. But then I kind of hit like my growth spurt, you know, I lost, <laughs> I lost a bunch of weight um, like baby fat and just became like really athletic basically. 
and fast. So my, my coach was like, Hey, do you, do you mind going to center field? Like we have other guys who, you know, would help us if they're in the lineup and they play here. And I was like, yeah, sure. So I ended up being the best thing I ever did um, moving to center field. So I played there my junior, senior year was, was recruited everywhere as, as a center fielder, as an outfielder, um, went to Rutgers as that played center field, my first three years there. And then my senior year, we didn't have, we flat out did not have a first baseman. We like just did not have one. So my coach, we had two freshmen coming in that were strictly outfielders, like lefties. Um, and he was like, you know, will you move there? You're the only one we think can do it. And they're, you know, would help us most if they were in the lineup playing outfield. And I said, no, at first for like three months and during summer ball, I was like, no, because I was getting tons of draft interest as an, as an outfielder. I'm like, why, you know, I can't do this. Ended up saying yes, ended up being the best thing I ever did. Um, my coach, you know, told me how to play. I never played first base growing up either. So he told me how to play first base, ended up getting pretty good at it. Stuck me at third base a couple of games in, at Rutgers. Um, so when I got drafted, yeah, they were like, you know, we want you to play all over. And basically that, the rest is history. It was great for me because, um, I, you know, it's probably been split in the minors up until this year. I didn't play first base like at all this season, but um, it's been first base and in the outfield probably pretty even. But in the minors, you know, sometimes, especially when I wasn't playing well, you have guys who are, they say, like priority guys who need to play every day, high draft picks, whatever it is. Um, so when I was struggling, you know, it was nice. My coaches you gave them options. Like if someone needed a day off, I could play first base or I could go back to the outfield or whatever. And that kind of helped me like stick around when it wasn't going well. Cause I always played uh, pretty good defense, even when I wasn't hitting. So, um, it's definitely helped me in, in the national league, huge thing to be able to play a couple different spots for sure. Absolutely. And Colin can even speak to this too. I think Colin, aren't you the third string long snapper? Like how much does like being able to play multiple positions? Uh, I think you even played a little four, <clears throat> like, you know, just like every, the position versatility that you guys can bring to a team. Like how valuable is that to, uh, to you know, to sticking around? It's such an archbishop would thing to be position versatile. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. So for sure. I mean, I think for me, yeah. Tight end. I mean, that's the definition of it. Um, I can do a little bit of everything. That's probably my greatest strength. Am I great at anything? No. Um, but I probably am better at some things than others, but I can do all of it uh, to some extent. And then, yeah, to have the long snap capability too, that I started at Wood and my high school coaches saying, you got to continue this. And I played, you know, CYL football and I would long snap 10 yards with one hand because I was like, oh, I'm this two hand thing. Like I can do it just as well with one, you know, and then you develop obviously into a two handed snapper and different things from that. And yeah, so it, I honestly, when my football career ends as a tight end, I would consider going back as a snapper. Uh, you know, that's a whole other thing. You know, like for Brian, it'd be like, yeah, when I get older and my bat's still hot, like I'm not going to run around as much. I'm going to go play first base, right? Like, so there's definitely correlation for sure, Justin. Great question. Yeah, like, and also shout out Rutgers. I think they're ahead of the curve in terms of like breaking the mold of a traditional first baseman. Because now in baseball, you have guys like Cody Bellinger and Chris Bryant who can run around, play the outfield, and, you know, go, they're getting away from the mold of a traditional, like, slow, lumbering first baseman. Um, like, how have you seen, like, the first base position evolve in your time in the big leagues? One thing Colin just said I thought was great, though, too. Like, I agree with yeah. you. And, and uh, like, it's so hard to be elite at, like, one thing at this level, you know. So I'm the same way. I'm just – pretty good at like everything. I don't do anything unbelievably, but I do a lot of things well, but I think that's, unless you're a freak of the freaks, man, you gotta, you gotta be kind of like that. But um, yeah, first base, that's, that's definitely been a trend. You still have some guys, you know, who are your big home run hitters who, who you stick at first base, but the infield play has become so important and the athleticism at first base has become so important that you, you have guys doing that. Um, I remember, you know, playing against Cody when he was – when we were in short season, like just got drafted, and he was like – he was out of high school, so he was like 18 or whatever and uh, playing first base. <clears throat> but it's um, it's just so much more valuable to have a guy who can pick it or who can move, especially now with the shifts we put on 
you know, you're covering a lot of ground, but the farther away you can be from the base, obviously you're covering more range or, you know, you can, you have more time to get to the bag. It, it's, it's the, the, the way the game's changing. It's, it's just huge. And now, yeah, people move around. It just can change the lineup. If you can go first base center field or left field, you know, whatever it is, it's just gives your manager more, more tools to, to do everything. And then flip side financially, right. We're going to pay Brian a three-year deal at, you know, a solid, right. That mid, that middle range that it's the same in football is taking a hit. And that's why with COVID last year, there's a lot of things we've given up as players to keep the salary cap where it is, even though we lose a lot of the benefits like 401k and paid for education and all those little things that we get because they were going to lower the salary cap. You'd only pay the great players. And then guys like me that are on minimums would be, would be in. Um, so no, it's, it's a unique process with that. And I think too, when it comes to payment, like we talked about is okay. You, we have two or three Brian O'Grady type players. Those guys can fill these voids, right? And that's what you've been on these teams is, you can get in at a lineup. Now you have the opportunity to say, okay, listen, I, yeah, I can go and do all that. We know that I could be a pinch hitter in the MLB, even though it's extremely hard to do. It's like coming in as a backup quarterback in the fourth quarter. I have some buddies in the league that do that and they hate it, <laughs> right? Like it's brutal. So uh, long story short for me, it really what I'm saying is I think, you know, it's going to give you a great opportunity over there and, and you're up JA, but a great opportunity over there to get your feet, you know, in the ground, as you know, and say, hey, listen, like, I, I need to be playing a lot, which is really cool. Yeah. I, so, you know, again, I, I was looking through all, like, you must have had so many great experiences the last couple of years in the big leagues. Um, you know, 2020, the weird COVID season, you were with Tampa. Did, did you travel with the team during their, their playoff and World Series run? Yep. I was with Tampa the whole time. I, I you know, I went, uh, I played, I actually played in, I think, only two games. I was active for... I don't know, 15 or so probably, but that whole time. Yeah. Like I was literally, cause we had, they call it taxi squads. You know, you bring an extra couple, two or three guys, whatever, everywhere um, in case something happened. And yeah, so I was there the whole season, all through the playoffs, world series, all of it, man. It was, uh, it was a, you know, it was a lot of fun and, and it kind of sucked at the same, at the same time, <laughs> but it was, you know, I wanted, I just wanted to be playing. That, that's what I'm saying. It sucked. Uh, you know, I wanted to be out there, but it, uh, you know, there's such a great, that, that is, I had so much fun. The people there are awesome. That organization's great. Um, you know, our, our taxi squad, it was, it was me, Nate Lowe, who was the starting first, first baseman for the Rangers this year and hit 260 with 20, getting a, you know, a chance to play. And then Wander Franco, who everyone, you know, who follows baseball knows now, um, and Vidal Bruhan was another prospect who made it up there this year. So we were, I mean, the talent that was there was, was unreal. So it, it was a lot of fun to just be a part of um, that whole run. It was, it was cool. Absolutely. Like guys can play their entire career without going to a world series. Uh, and granted, you know, you probably would have liked to been out there playing a little bit, but like, what did you kind of take away and learn from your experience around a team that was on a deep postseason run and especially an organization as well run as Tampa is? Man, we we just did the the little things nonstop. Like Tampa plays great defense every day in the infield. It was the worst. It was the worst part, dude. That was where I played third base the most because they thought I was athletic enough and and saw me do it. And they were like, "Man, you know, we want you to go over there." So the worst part of every day when I was in Tampa was Cashy, the manager, Kevin Cash. We take our normal ground balls, you know, and then the end for the last like 15 minutes, he'd have a guy on a knee and he'd just be, I mean, smoking fungo ground balls, like game, like, like, I mean, hitting these things around, like working around the infield for 15 minutes. And it was, I was more nervous doing that than I like anything else, you know, but you see like Willie Adamas now with the Brewers, like you see how, how well we played defense there. It wasn't, no uh, <clears throat> secret why, because we were, do, we were doing that every single day. And uh, but just the the communication um, with the Rays top to bottom, it was phenomenal. And it's 
you know, it's probably the same. Colin could probably say the same too. Like just having that kind of open communication and just like telling you like it is and, and what, what you need to do and what they need to see or get better at or whatever it is. I mean, like that's all you can ask for, you know, as a player, in my opinion, if you tell me you got to do this, then, Hey, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go do that. So um, they're just really, really good at that, that kind of stuff. No doubt. And something that I talk about, on here a lot we talk about on here a lot is how every organization is different some they're all good but i think the difference between like good to great there's a big gap right it's like how the gm is how the owner is how the head coach is how the the quality of life is the you know the your daily process yeah the schedule they're all kind of about the same but like who are the people that are really involved helping you like is there does your message get received to the top if you have one or is the message coming down from the top and you know where you stand um no doubt about it yeah it's definitely unique so my question is a real dead serious one were you ever to have a proper time in st pete a little postcard in a little uh, uh no uh, i no nothing because of covid I mean, um, yeah was when we you know when we were going on that playoff run we had we had some fun together in the hotels but no we weren't uh you know that was such a crazy year there was no no any of that until uh we, we were on lockdown we we really were like we couldn't um we were the bubble you know the team and everybody around the team was like locked into this um to the hotel once we the first round in st pete we could still like uber eats or doordash but once we left and went to san diego for the playoffs could the only food we could have was at the stadium when we were there or like the stuff they had at the hotel for us so for three weeks or whatever it was, man, I, like we were legit on lockdown. Yeah. So it, this is another thing that I'm so fascinated about is like you and Colin, you, you guys have had the opportunity to play with so many superstars, like, you know, Colin right now with McCaffrey. And it, when you're in San Diego, Tatis, M Manny Machado, like, like how, you know, how much of that interaction in the locker room is picking the brain, like trying to like, you know, learn and trying to figure out how these guys kind of operate. <clears throat> Yeah, it, it was, I, I had no, like, I have no shame. Like I'll, I'll ask people anything, you know, because you're trying to try and get better. And I haven't, there's not been one person um, who's like been like, you know, shut me down or anything. Like I found everybody's willing to talk about whatever it is that, that you want to, you know, Joey Votto was the first guy in Cincinnati that I would ask stuff and he would give me very, very long in-depth answer answers <laughs> about everything. But they, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, man. I, you know, right away, Manny came right off to me, you know, saying what's up immediately. You know, it, it's, it's just funny because I've been watching these guys forever and then you're there with them and they're just, you know, now they're my friends. I don't even like think twice, think twice about it. You know, I'm like playing Warzone with, with Haas and my buddies are in there with them. They're like, Oh my God, it's Eric Hosmer. And I'm, you know, it's just like, to me, it's, you know, it's just Haas. But um, I asked everybody, man, Manny, asked Manny, Toddy, you know, what do you think when you're hitting Will Myers, Haas, me and Haas talked a ton of first base, Kevin Kiermeyer picking his brain in the outfield, man. Um, Cause he's unbelievable out there. You know, I try to get as much information as I can about – because you never know in baseball, and I don't know if it's the same in football, but you never know what that little thing somebody might say, whether it's hitting or if it's defensively, that might really click for you. So I'm – if I get around somebody like that, man, I'm, I'm trying to – I'm trying to talk to them at some point. You're for sure picking the brains of the greats, for sure. You're picking the brains of everybody, which I know you are too. Uh, and that conversation is endless. I think the one difference between baseball and football is – I get a lot from film. Now I don't, I can't speak on baseball, but I watch a ton of film of tight ends across the league every week. I watch a lot of our game film, a lot of my own stuff I need to prepare for. I watch who we're playing, no doubt. But I have my process for like a segment of what I'm going to watch is what other tight ends are doing across the league. Is it against the team we're playing? Of course, that's all week. But also like what really the night, I watch a lot of the Niners. I watch a lot of Kittle. I watch what those they do with their guys. I like their offensive line play you know, the wide zone play action stuff. So a lot of stuff that we do. So I watch a lot of the Niners stuff. I watch them all, but I really do watch a lot of Niners because the way they do things. And I pick up things all the time with footwork. I pick up things all the time with their motions and shifts. So 
in that regard, there's probably a little bit more I'm watching and different things with footwork, like how they're playing this defensive end this week compared to that, that guy where maybe baseball, correct me if I'm wrong here, Brian would be like, yeah, if you're watching <clears throat> film, it'd be like, well, they're playing this guy, they're playing a the shift like this, playing a shift like that, or, the, or you're watching maybe what they're doing in the batter's box, how they're approaching a guy. How does that work? Yeah. In baseball, like in the big leagues, you'll have, we have meetings every day, like the starting pitcher. We'll go over all the relievers. Like, this is what they do. This is what they like to do. Um, it's, I think it's a little tougher in baseball because it's just so more like individualized, yep. you know, they're, they might pitch to their strengths, you know, pitcher might have like, this is no matter what, this is how he attacks these kind of guys, but you know, how he's pitching Manny Machado versus how he's pitching me is probably different. You know what I mean? So that's like the only, only big difference right there probably. But I, you know, I watch video of all the hitters too. you know, try to pick things up and stuff like that too, or try to match video, you know, my, is my swing looking like this? Um, so it's definitely some similarities there, but definitely slightly different in, in baseball as well. Last one for me here, and then we'll send it over to Justin. You can wrap things up with whatever you got, Jay, and then the rapid fire. But are there certain guys in the league that you have a ton of respect for that you watch? I just said a guy like George Kittle for me. Like, I'm going to watch a lot more Kittle than I am a Travis Kelsey because we have more similarities. Now, Kittle's a freak of nature. I'm not a freak of nature. Uh, but he does a lot more things than I would than Travis Kelsey or Zach Ertz. But I'll watch more Dallas Goddard. I'll watch more old school Jason Witten. Um, I'll watch, you know, I'm not watching Antonio Gates cause I'm not running 50 routes a game and making one handed catches. Uh, so it's much different for me. Uh, there are guys in the league that you watch that you relate to. Yeah, I def, I watch, man, I watch a ton of guys and it's, it's all over the place. You know, I'm just trying to pick up anything that I can, but there's definitely certain hitters. I love Juan Soto from the nationals. I, I, he's unbelievable. Um, the way he takes pitches and, and, his eye is just phenomenal. Joey Votto playing with him and, and watching how he's evolved this past year too was, was really cool. Um, so I like watching him and then guys on my own team, man, I, I had guys, you know, right next to me who were some of the best players in the game. So I was watching, you know, watching them all the time, Manny and Toddy. Um, and they, yeah, they might have a little more God given talent than, than some people too, but, uh, who else do I really like to watch, man? Aaron Judge is one from the Yankees. I, I you know, he's a freak. I like watching, <clears throat> watching him. But his swing, I mean, you know, he's built like he's closer to you. He might be bigger than you. You know, he's way bigger. He is. Than but uh, <laughs> his swing is uh, so efficient, man. You know, I, I like watching those those swings that I think are, are super efficient and and just get the job done. So um, he's another one. But I bounce all around, man trying to learn anything I can or anybody that's, you know, doing well, is, you know, what, what are they doing really well? Why are they doing so well? You know, is there something I can see? And, uh, you know, in baseball, it's funny. You, most guys end up in the same kind of spot when they're hitting. Eventually it all looks different in the beginning, but you could see the similarities between anybody who's a really good hitter at, at some point, you know? One thing I'm, I'm really like fascinated about is like the scouting report of pitchers. Like, obviously you guys have a plethora of video. You have every kind of angle possible. Like, do you find it like more helpful to get a scouting report of a pitcher off of like the, the video and what you've seen? Or if like, there's a guy who just faced and walks back in the dugout and says, watch out for his nasty curveball. Does that, when guys walk back to the dugout and say that, does that actually work? It's funny. Cause yes and no, I, 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 I feel like it's, you see things different, you know, how your eyes work, see things different. Like a lot of, a lot of times guys are like, man, you know, it's really running, you know, or sinking away from you. And then I get in there and it looks straight as an arrow to me. Like I don't even see it. And then you see it on video and you're like, Oh wow. Like <laughs> it's moving. So I think, I think both are, are valuable, but you also at the same time have to understand like, you know, when I'm actually in there, seeing it, it might look different. Like one for me was a uh, pinch hit against Max Scherzer this year in Washington. And I was like, you know, talking to my hitting coach, like, Hey, he likes to, uh, you know, he likes to flip in that, that first pitch curveballs get me over just to get ahead of you, like pinch hitters. So, uh, and he's, you know, we're talking and I'm like, man, I, I'm going to, I'm staying on the fastball because if he throws me one right down the middle and I don't swing at it, like I'm probably screwed and I'm going to be really mad at myself. So get in there. And I stay, and I'm thinking that, staying on the fastball, and he throws a fastball. <clears throat> and in my mind, I'm like, 
I take it, strike. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, man, that was it. Like, it was right down the middle. And I just stared at it. Go back to the video. And thing, you know, it just – it started down the middle, and it just went, you know, at 96 and ended up, like, perfectly on the outside corner at my knees. And I'm like, oh, you know, my eyes didn't swing at you. I didn't swing at it for a reason. My brain didn't work fast enough to figure it out, but, like, my eyes were like, nope, that's that's not it. So – it, it's funny how it just kind of – it works out that way where it's just – it's different when you're in there. But all that information is definitely valuable. I'd rather have some of that information going into it as opposed to just being like, all right, here we go. Like, let's see what happens. Is Max Scherzer the most intimidating pitcher you face? He's up there for sure. He's up there. I fa- I pinched it against the ground this year too. That was in uh, – in New York and it was packed um, in the beginning of the season when we were playing really well too. So that, those are probably the the two uh, definitely two up there. I'm trying to think if there's anybody else. I'd probably say those, those were number one and and, and number two this year for sure. Scherzer and and the ground, which now they're both on the same team. So have fun. (laughs) Have fun, Bill. Uh, <laughs> have yeah, fun. I'll exactly. be in Japan. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> and Elise is on notice. Uh, I just had some rapid fire. Colin, if you had anything else. Okay. Uh, all right. So your first big league home run, massive shot. I watched the video in Seattle. Like, what do you remember about that and, like, everything it meant to you? Uh, first, you know, that was a pinch hit, and it was off a guy named Austin Adams, who's with the Padres now and is one of my buddies. So that was always fun. Uh, talking to him this year about about that because he remembers it very clearly too uh so before I pinch hit I was in the cage with uh two of the coaches from the Reds and we were literally working on down and in sliders because that's what Austin throws an unbelievable slider like he throws it like 90 percent of the time um and the guys still can't hit it so we're working on that like down and in and they told me to swing and miss like inside the ball. And I was like, why, you know, like swing and miss a specific way off the machine. I'm like, why? That doesn't make any sense. Did that for like a couple. And they're like, all right, hit. And I just started hitting line drives, like, you know, figured it out. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. So I go out there and it's that, and it it was a fastball, but it was down and in like right where we're working and there it goes. But yeah, it was, as soon as I hit it, I knew it, but I didn't want to, you know, it was my first one. I had just been in the big leagues. I didn't want to like stand there and watch it or anything. So I was like trying to start running, but I'm like, Oh man, you know? And then uh, at the time it put us up two one. So I was pretty excited. Um, we ended up losing that game, but uh, it was just, man, like felt like I was floating around the bases, you know, it was just kind of like that. Uh, I'd been there for, you know, a couple weeks or whatever at that point, but it was just kind of like, wow, like, you know, this is it. I did it. There's the first one. And it was a lot of, pre- a lot of pressure uh, off my back. Cause I had a lot of home runs that year at AAA and everyone was kind of like, you know, when are you going to hit one here? So I was like, thank, thank you. It's, it's over with now. I can just play. That's awesome. Yeah. It was such, it was, it was like way down low too. You had to golf it to get it out of there. It was so sick. Um, so I saw that back in college. I want to take you back to Rutgers a little bit. Uh, I found an interesting little nugget that Colin might not be happy with. This was a game against Temple. Sorry, Colin. Uh, <laughs> you, you had you had a walk off, but the game was like four plus hours long. Were, were you more excited that you won the game, or were you more excited that you got to go home? Both, because that was like the most miserable day of my life until that at bat. I was like zero for five or zero for six. Like I, I had not had a good game that day, and it was literally we didn't have lights. Rockers. So the game was like, it was legitimately starting to get dark out too. Like, I don't know how much longer they were going to let us play. And uh, I was so mad. Like I really was, I was so mad because I was oh for whatever. And we just kept playing and uh, I hit that and I was, oh my God, I was so happy. I was like, thank God that this is over and uh, made the day a lot better after that too. The swing that ended Temple baseball because Temple baseball is no more. They were, they were, I mean, at least that year, they were a pretty good team. They were scrappy, man. They, they, they weren't bad. I was, I felt bad for those dudes that they were getting canceled. Yeah. It's a shame. It, Justin, they had like a mass canceling of athletics. I think 2011, 12. Yeah. Right around there somewhere. And it's before I got there, maybe 13 and uh, somewhere in that, in that area. And they were almost canceled football. 
which would have been crazy. You never do cancel football, <laughs> right? You saw what happened and then whatever we, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's just history, but yeah, Temple baseball is no more. And I was devastated because I became close with a lot of, you know, uh, of Florida Gator baseball guys and still my buddies to this day. Um, that and some that, you know, Keenan Kish and a bunch of those guys. So, but yeah, it was a bummer. I was <coughs> love, I love going to Gator, Gator baseball and they're really good, but it would have been fun to go to Temple baseball for sure. Where did they play, Bri? They, they played all the way out in Ambler. Ambler, the old yeah. Ambler campus, baby. Oh, yep. That's where they played. Uh, what else you got, Jay? So you followed in the footsteps of the Todd father, Todd Frazier, Rutgers to the Reds. Do you, do you keep up with the Todd father? Do you still talk to him? Like, what's your relationship like with him? Yeah, I do. Todd's a, Todd's a great dude. He's um, as, as South Jersey as they are, Central Jersey as they come, man. He's, just, he's Tom's River legend. But he, uh, wow. yeah, he right away when I got drafted, he reached out and then um, he took care of me while he was, you know, at spring training and stuff when I, when he was still with the Reds and I was younger, he was, you know, always helping me out, always talking to me. Um, and then, yeah, since then, man, I still, we still talk Twitter or whatever. Um, see him at like the alumni stuff. He's always, you know, telling me, oh man, you had a great year, you know, I was keeping up with you, all this stuff. He's, uh, hasn't changed one bit since then. And yeah, he's, he's a good dude. The take care of you aspect thing. You know, people think it's more than it is. It's not more than it is. It's not less than it is, but it's always the right amount. You always have someone to talk to. I always talk about Justin Pugh, who's a council rock guy. Mm -hmm. And Justin went to the Giants, and I'm the undrafted guy. He was a first-round pick a couple of years before. And you just don't have – pro sports are tough. You don't know anybody. Mm -hmm. There's it's literally nothing. So if you can connect with anybody about anything, it's like, boom, let's – you're, like, all in on it because you're just trying to – have that same feeling you had before. Like, yeah, the, the play matters, but yeah, you have to live. You're a human being. Like you're trying to have conversations between at bats or between plays or when you're meeting or when you're eating or whatever. So Justin was huge for me. He took me under his wing, took care of me, man, because I'm without Justin, like I, I would have had a much rougher rookie experience uh, uh, for sure. When it came to like making me sing in front of the team and all that <laughs> stuff, uh, Justin took care of me. So what do you got Jay to finish up? Yeah, last one. Uh, I think we, we brought it up earlier, but your, your back company, Richie Bats. It's, I was looking at your website. It's like the coolest thing ever. So many of the guys in like the minors and the pros, shout out Lars Newbar are using them. Like, how did you start? Get, how did you get into that? And like, you know, how have you seen it grown so far? Yeah, so they, um, they started making the bats. Uh, my father-in-law got involved um, and they wanted to be, you know, in the MLB, you got to be certified. So it helps to have a guy who swings them to, with that process. So they asked me if I wanted to invest in it. And I said, yep. And uh, so that's 2020 was our first year and we were doing really well. And then the pandemic hit. So that kind of messed up uh, in terms of the like MLB stuff. But yeah, this past year, um, my buddies are our pro sales rep now uh, from down here. And I believe we had over 80 guys total swinging them in pro ed, like minor leagues and I don't know how many big guys in big leagues actually swung them, but that's a lot of guys for, you know, basically the first year. So uh, it's going really well. We do uh, the BB core bats now, which are the metal bats everyone uses nowadays because uh, they didn't change them. So, but our, you know, we do uh, the youth We're we're like number one or two in the youth market, depending on where you look at. Um, so we do really well with that. They are, they're so cool. The customization you can do, the different colors, all the things uh, that you can do on the website. I wish, you know, in the MLB, there's only certain colors and things you can use. I wish we could just use whatever because there's some some really cool bats they make. Um, so it's a lot of fun. Obviously, it's something I know a lot about. And hopefully, you know, when my playing days are over, we can, we can just be doing that and I'll just make bats <laughs> for, for the rest of my life. But it's, it's a lot of fun, man. And, Hopefully I'll use them in Japan and then we will be all over the place. International man. International. I love Gotta it. Gotta get certified over there real quick. And then, then we'll be using them there too. Great questions. Jay. Yeah. I had a, I, I had a bat customized for my dad for his bar. Uh, yeah, we got to get some not for long ones, man. Yeah, yeah, we got to get some not for Justin and I were talking about that earlier. We got to, we'll figure it out. We can do some, maybe some gear swap and. Uh, sounds, sounds good. Yeah. So guys go on to the holidays too. And you can like make a custom bat. You know, it's not like the real bat. You can't really swing it with a baseball, it'll probably crack in half, but it's it looks like a real bat and it feels like a real bat. And you can hit a tennis ball with it and play beer baseball with it for sure. 
for those that are acquiring. But yeah, I mean, a little custom <clears throat> Christmas gift would be cool. Uh, last question for me, Brad. When do you head over? When do you head overseas? The, it's supposed to be the end of January. Okay. So February 1st in Japan is, is spring training every year. So before this new variant stuff happened, it was a three-day quarantine. Hopefully it's back to that. And uh, But we'll, we'll see what happens. But that's the plan right now. They're not too worried about it. So it'll be the, the end of January, and uh, that'll be it. I guess not the last question for me. Um, a lot of American-born players over there? Not a ton. No, it's, it's, I, I don't know if it's, um, if they have a, a max of how many foreigners you can have because Spanish guys go to, um, but there's a, there's a, there's a decent amount. I, there's at least two, at least on each team. Um, but then they, they, yeah, well, so right. I actually have a, one of my buddies is going to, uh, is on my team you might he married uh, a wood girl so small world and i ended up with him with the race and now we're, we're both going to japan together small world small, small world, world. <laughs> no <laughs> doubt about it well brian o'grady wish you nothing but the best of luck man go on guys and buy some bats for your family richie bats for the holidays we're going to look forward to supporting you and, and now we got something to watch yeah like you know I, I don't need to watch the phillies until probably september so i'll be watching brian overseas Love it. Yeah. I was watching Adam Jones highlights of him over in Japan crushing homers earlier. Yep. There you go. That's that's yep. the plan. But they have a home run. Hold on. Again, another question. I'm the worst. They have a home run derby for sure, right? That's a great question. I'm not sure. I'd love to be in it if they do, though. We're gonna fly over, not for long media. We got a big budget. You know, we'll fly yeah. over and some more Brian. I you can stay with me, man. Come on over. Brian O'Grady, appreciate you coming on, man. Thanks for having me, guys. It was fun.